All right, everybody, welcome back to Introduction to Multicultural Literatures of the U.S. Today we are starting a new kind of unit, a new chapter in the course. The course, as you'll remember, is organized historically and kind of chronologically. So we are moving through the, the 20th century on our way to the present. We will end in with a text that is um, less than a decade old. So we're moving through the 20th century. We began the course with modernism in the early 20th century, and now we are starting a unit on mid-20th century literature, on mid-century literature, which I described on the syllabus as a period of realism, which is a word I'm using in two different senses, as I'll explain in a moment. Uh, I think the mid-20th century is a very particular period, sort of a transitional moment between the more famous periods of modernism before it and of postmodernism after it. However, there is also increasing interest, I would say, academically and even among you know non-academic readers in this mid twentieth century period, due to its, I think, variety. I think it's the very fact that it was a transitional period means that it has a lot of kind of diversity of cultural expressions within it, and also, and we will talk about this when we talk about our next novel, The Martyred by Richard E. Kim, it was also a period in which, due to the pressures of the Cold War, as I'll explain, literature and art became very directly political, and even politically manipulated, as I think you'll see later. Uh, so that's that's where I want to start. I want to talk about mid-century. I want to talk about realism in its two senses. And I, as I always do, I kind of start with visual art. I think nothing better illustrates the diverse character, or even maybe better than diverse, we could talk about the kind of bifurcated, the divided character of mid-century cultural expression. Uh, because one of the things that I'm about to talk about is how the period was divided into very impersonal forms of art, very impersonal forms of late modernist art on the one hand. Uh, it was a kind of continuation of modernism that took to an extreme modernism's um, not sort of speaking personally. And we saw that if you think back to some of the poems we read, we read the uh, In a Station of the Metro by Ezra Pound in which the word I doesn't occur. It's kind of an impression coming from somewhere. We read The Negro Speaks of Rivers by Langston Hughes in which the I does not appear to be Langston Hughes's personal I, but a much more long living almost cosmic kind of consciousness of a of the civilizations of color of the world i think that this impersonal late modernism continues and even in some ways dominates the mid 20th century period and you see it very clearly in this piece of architecture that is my first image by the french architect le corbusier and this was what was known as the international style of architecture and this was invented in the modernist moment in the 20s and 30s, but then became the dominant form of almost, I would say, of global architecture in the United States and around the world in the mid 20th century. And what it was characterized as was uh, some people who would make fun of it would say, you know, everything was a white box. It was uh, it was architecture that was based on kind of very rectilinear squares of unadorned material, glass, steel, and concrete. Whereas before, the art style of architecture might have been attempting, you know, if you go, this is not so much true in Minneapolis, but it's true in, in many other cities in America, you know, if, where there's buildings that have been standing for a hundred years, they used to try to make, you know, banks look like Gothic cathedrals. And the international style architect said, let's get rid of all that ornamentation, all those facades, and create um, something that can be mass produced out of cheap materials and that would be the artistic statement would be the removal of extra ornamentation. Just as Ezra Pound in poetry said remove every superfluous word, these architects said remove every superfluous detail and they create this very impersonal monumental rectilinear style impersonal late modernism. On the other hand, 
in the mid-century period, you have the development of extremely personal styles of art that are beginning to bubble up and to emerge and that would characterize the later 20th century. Uh, and I think that's very clearly illustrated in visual arts by the painter Jackson Pollock, who was well known for his drip paintings. He would put the canvas on the floor and kind of drip, or in some cases fling paint at it to create these very chaotic uh, compositions. This was a form of art called abstract expressionism. And what was abstract about it was that they these were just shapes and colors. They weren't pictures of anything. So in that sense, they were investigations of the, uh, of the shapes and colors that made up art, and that way they were abstract. However, the personal element is expressionism. He's expressing his inner self, his inner life, the chaos within him by um, kind of attacking the canvas in this way. These were sometimes also called action paintings. So on the one hand, this, this is abstract, but it's a very personal form of abstraction. It's this primal expression of the chaos within the artist. And I think that these two images, the, the white box, the rectilinear box of international style architecture, and the roiling sea of chaos that is the painting of abstract expressionism, for me, that defines the division in sensibility of mid-century culture, this modernism that's hanging on from the early 20th century on the one hand and this new form of very personal expressionistic art that will uh that looks forward to the late 20th century so let's get some more detail into our characterization of mid-century culture which i've defined as the period after world war ii so 1945 up to 1968. now these dates are arbitrarily chosen um, culture is never that neat. It's never that simple. There's always, I, I, I like to think there was a literary theorist named Raymond Williams. He was a Marxist theorist, though I don't think you have to be a Marxist to see that what he says here is, is very persuasive. He says at any given moment in culture, there are what he called residual elements, what he called dominant elements, and what he called emergent elements. The residual is stuff that's hanging on from the past that is has sort of lost a little bit of its uh, force, but it's still around. The dominant is whatever the dominant culture is at the moment, and the emergent is what's just starting to, to come up, okay? And I think this is a great period to look at where you can see residual dominant and emergent elements. So I've defined it as being 1945 to 1968. I think 1968 was in many ways the height of, you know, what we call the 60s, which is really, what we call the 60s was, was really something that goes from about 1967 to 1975, this moment of cultural protest of the emergence of new forms of counterculture. And we're going to investigate that very closely in our next unit on postmodernism. So the mid-century is what, what is in between, the end of World War II up to the, the quote-unquote 60s. So what's going on in America and in the world in, in this period? So number one, you have to understand the Cold War. This is going to be a major context for our next novel. The Cold War is after the Allied forces of the United States joined with the Soviet Union defeat Nazi Germany, then there uh, follows a conflict, an ideological conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, between the capitalist and communist systems. Okay, And both, at this point, communist states, but also the capitalist states of post-World War II, which began to rely more and more on kind of corporations and corporate structures to administer the economics of the of the United States and of other capitalist countries. Both capitalist and communist states were characterized as these vast and complex administrative apparatuses, very much like international style architecture, which as it began to define the physical landscape of the cities of, uh, of the capitalist world, you know, these states were confronting you with these sort of white boxes, these impersonal, alienating boxes that just sort of stood 
for this administrative society that was increasingly, whether it was in the state-controlled economies of the communist world or the increasingly corporatist economies of the capitalist world, it seemed like they were arranging everybody into grids, okay? So this, this sense of sort of white and gray grids taking over culture and generating uh, paranoia and alienation is a clear characteristic of mid-century culture. Now that's happening in the what used to be called, they used to talk about the first world, which was the capitalist world, the second world, which was the communist world, and then the third world, which were the formerly colonized states of the global south that were uh, formally non-aligned with either of the two powers, uh, the Soviet Union and the United States, and were often the site of proxy wars because the capitalist world and the communist world often wanted to control these countries in Latin America and Africa and Asia to, to bring them into the folds of capitalism or communism to exploit them for their resources in a kind of neo-colonialism. So from the perspective of the global south of what used to be called the third world, the term Cold War is very misleading because it was called the Cold War because it was an ideological war conducted through things like espionage and propaganda, but was not a violent war. And that might have been true in the United States, Western Europe, and Russia, but it wasn't true in Vietnam. It wasn't true in Korea. It wasn't true in Nicaragua. In those places, the capitalist and communist worlds sort of waged these proxy battles that were wars. They were just wars. They were hot wars. Um, so. That's the global political situation. The other thing that's important to remember is the way World War II ended. World War II ended with the dropping of the atomic bomb by the United States on two cities in Japan. And then shortly after that, the Soviet Union developed nuclear technology. And so one thing that you have to understand characterizes the mid-century period is this fear of nuclear Armageddon. For the first time in the history of the world, there is the possibility that humanity uh, can bring the world to an end through nuclear war. There had always been thoughts about the end of the world, but it was always a religious idea. There was never an idea that, there was never a secular way that humanity could bring all life on Earth to a conclusion. But now, with the Cold War, both sides possessing nuclear weapons, there's this literal secular fear of the end of the world that is unprecedented in human history. And I think this accounts too for an enormous amount of the alienation and anxiety people felt in this period. Now, it wasn't all bad news for everybody. So in the United States, the United States comes out the victor in World War II, and unlike Europe or Russia, was not you know, materially devastated by the war. So Europe, by the end of the war, is in ruins. Russia sustained enormous losses. And the United States sustained losses of, um, of, of troops, which was terrible. But the country itself was not destroyed in the war. And so there's an economic boom because the U.S. is kind of able to take over the, the industrial lead in the world over Europe. So there's an economic boom, and then there's the GI Bill, which is where the government, the U.S. government, um, gave returning soldiers sort of access to education and access to things like loans and things that allow for the development, the expansion of a middle class, the expansion of people with access to higher education, even things like the development of a highway system to unite the country, and the creation of the suburbs, really, which is a, a development that really happens with this, you know, this expanded middle class needs somewhere to live. The United States had previously been a very agrarian country and then an urbanizing country, and then after World War II becomes a suburbanizing country. So in that sense, there is an economic boom, there is this growth of a middle class, and that does lead, that's what leads, I think, to some of the nostalgia for the 1950s in particular, that there was this period of an economic boom and the growth of the middle class that uh, people, some people, people who were the beneficiaries of this look back on fondly. But not everybody was the beneficiary of this and it, that itself bred certain resistance. So 
if we want to move the focus to racial politics. So as I just mentioned, abroad and outside the United States, you have decolonization. You have the former British Empire, the former French Empire, the countries that they controlled are uh, declaring independence, striking out on their own, whether that be um, India, whether it be um, Kenya, you have all of these countries decolonizing and forming often nationalist resistance movements to develop their own sense of independence as nations. However, as I already mentioned, this is affected by the conflict between the U.S. and the USSR. In the United States, though not unrelated to these movements of decolonization abroad, you have the beginnings of the civil rights movement, which is itself a response to the continued exclusion of African Americans from full civic, cultural, and economic participation. So for instance, a lot of returning African American soldiers were not really able to access the benefits of the economic boom and the GI Bill because there were still exclusions sometimes legal in the South, sometimes informal in the North, on where people could live, you know? So they're excluded from that suburbanization, from that growth of the middle class. They're still excluded from full civic and cultural participation due to the continuance of a great deal of just um, racist ideology within the culture. So that's something to, to keep an eye on, and we're gonna see evidence of that in the text we're gonna read. And then, as far as gender and sexual politics, because you have this, you know, these, uh, the, the men returning from the war are the beneficiaries of the GI Bill, and so they're incentivized to form nuclear families. One man, one woman, they have a couple kids, they move to the suburbs. In many ways, the mid-20th century was more conservative about gender and about sexuality, not only than what followed it, but in many ways it was more conservative than what preceded it. There was this real emphasis on the nuclear family, on a division between the man as the, you know, the man goes out to work, the woman keeps the house, the woman is maternal, the man participates in public life, and there's a total stigmatization of any non-normative sexuality. Again, when I, when I say normative, I don't mean normal. I mean what the dominant culture defines as normal. So that's, you know, if you're gay, that's completely kind of excluded from the picture that is in many places and in many ways functionally illegal, which will also lead to resistance in the, uh, in the, the general tide of movements of resistance in the 1960s. All right, I already mentioned my uh, next point, which is what is happening in the arts. In the arts, you have impersonal late modernism, which I again want to exemplify with this first image of the building of international style architecture, the rectilinear white box. Um, so that dominates, but also dominates in things like poetry, as we'll see. However, you then have the emergence of more personal styles. So a form of poetry that became prominent in the late 50s and early 60s was called confessional poetry. And that was poetry that was all about, as the title, as the name confessional suggests, it's all about the poets expressing their personal lives, their inner selves, and sometimes things that you weren't supposed to talk about in public, um, whether that be um, struggles with mental illness, struggles with addiction, adultery, sexuality, confessional poetry with this very personal style comes to the fore. Also, you have burgeoning new kinds of youth culture, of pop culture, and of counterculture. I think the biggest example here is rock and roll. You also have something we'll look at in the next unit, which is beat poetry and beat literature. I'll define that for you in the next unit. Um, but these two are, these resist that impersonal late modernism. They're very ecstatic styles. They're very personal styles. They're very oriented in the body. Um, one of the things that was very scandalous about rock and roll, just as with jazz before it, is that it inspired a form of dance that seemed to people who were more reserved as a very sexual form of dance, kind of this swinging of the hips and things like that. So, you know, forms of culture rooted in the body. So again, the point that I'm trying to make 
is mid-century culture is divided between these impulses, divided between the impersonal and the abstract on the one hand, which goes with the, de the development of these massive administrative states and bureaucracies and corporations, and then on the other hand, the, and in resistance to that, the development of messy, personal, eruptive uh, styles, okay? And then what's going on in fiction, I think, is you have a revival of realism and the fiction of ideas. And I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna hold off now. I'm gonna talk about that at length when I introduce our novel, The Martyred by Richard E. Kim. I'll explain what I mean there. So um, that's one way in which I wanna use the word realism to define the fiction of the period. And I'll, again, I'll explain what that means uh, in, next, uh, in, in, in the next lecture, I think. But I also wanna use the word realism in a more general sense. I think a sober, disillusioned, tragic realism is the leading cultural tone of the mid-century period. It was a period of the aftermath of World War II, the aftermath of the Holocaust, the aftermath of the atomic bomb dropped in Japan. It was a time of uh, nuclear anxiety. It was a time of paranoia because you have a cold war between these two states which are substantially using espionage. Their intelligence agencies are, as we, again we'll see in the next lecture, substantially involved in culture. So everybody feels like they're being bugged, they're being watched. So you have this realism. And what I mean by realism here is I mean it as the uh, antonym of idealism. It's no longer possible to believe that the world can be a, be a totally beautiful, totally just place, that the world can totally be home. Instead, um, everybody feels like the worst has happened. Um, one of the major poets of this period, Elizabeth Bishop, called the 20th century the worst so far. And I think she was thinking of the enormous destruction of World War II and the paranoia and fear of nuclear annihilation that followed it. So this leads to this realism, this sense that every good is compromised, nothing totally good can happen. Alienation from these vast bureaucracies is, uh, is experienced, paranoia is experienced. So I wanna use realism in that sense. And I think that type of realism will define several of the poems we're going to read, and it will very much define the novel, The Martyred, that we're going to read in this period, which is realist in two senses. It's also a realist novel in that it is a kind of faithful representation of everyday life, but we'll talk about that in the next lecture. For now, I want to go on to read some poems to begin to see some evidence as to what this period is all about in literature. I want to read four poems, um, I think I've kind of defi divided them into pairs. I think the, the first two are very short and very kind of non-monumental. And then the uh, last two are very impersonal, late modernist. I also think they can be divided up by three of them are impersonal. In three of them, you don't hear the voice of the poet at all. And so they represent the impersonal, late modernism of the period, and one of them is not only very personal, but it's a kind of manifesto in favor of personal poetry. So the four poems I wanna look at are We Real Cool by Gwendolyn Brooks and The Poem as Mask by Muriel Ruckheiser and Middle Passage by Robert Hayden and More Light, More Light by Anthony Hecht. So I wanna start looking at those and uh, I don't know if I'll cover all of them today. We might have to roll into the next lecture, but that will be fine. I still have about 35 minutes or 40 minutes to talk right now. So I'm gonna get right into these poems. I want to talk about Gwendolyn Brooks' We Real Cool almost as a way of reintroducing poetry to the class, because as you saw from my previous lecture, we are going to uh, start to think about writing your paper in this class. And one of the things I mentioned in that lecture on paper writing, on essay writing, was I mentioned that you will want to connect your literary observations, your observations about the formal literary features of the poem, to your observations about its themes. One of the ways that literature works, and especially poetry works, 
is that it expresses its themes through the way it's written. And so I want to look at this poem. It's, 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 it reminds me of in a station of the Metro in the sense that it's a very short poem, but it contains great multitudes. You can talk about it for hours. I won't talk about it for hours, but I do want to make some observations about the literary techniques it uses and what they have to do with the themes it expresses. So this is a poem written by Gwendolyn Brooks. She was born in Topeka, Kansas in 1917. Her parents were very ambitious and artistic people. They moved to Chicago in the Great Migration, and she's very much a poet connected to a place. She's very much considered the poet of Chicago. Uh, I think uh, I, I'm not from Chicago or anything, but my understanding is she's very honored in that city. And um, she went to a variety of schools. Her mother encouraged her to write. And she never attended college, but she attended many poetry workshops and published her first book of poems, A Street in Bronzeville, in 1945, which, as you can see from her birth date, would make her fairly young, still in her 20s. So um, she comes out very early as a, an important poet, and she wins the Pulitzer Prize. She's the first African-American poet to win the Pulitzer Prize in 1950. She becomes more radical with age. By the time of the protest movements of the 60s, late 60s, she becomes very much uh, interested in those radical movements that we'll study in a, in, a, uh, in a couple lectures from now of the late 60s. And she even stops publishing with mainstream publishers and publishes with small presses that were run by and publishing work directed toward black readers because I think her idea was... Um, that you know she she didn't she thought it was kind of she increasingly came to see it as a compromising position for a black writer to always be addressing white audiences and um and sort of bowing before white audiences expectations so she took leave of that and she uh she became much more interested in radical forms of particular african-american forms of expression However, even in a comparatively early poem like We Real Cool, we can see evidence that she's still interested in these unique forms of expression. <clears throat> so I'm going to read the poem, and then I'm going to make a series of observations about its literary technique and how they connect to its meaning. So it's called We Real Cool, and then it has this kind of caption which tells you who's speaking where. So the pool players seven at the golden shovel we real cool we left school we lurk late we strike straight we sing sin we thin gin we jazz june we die soon so that's the poem it's very short and it's just a series of it's just a, a series of three word declarative sentences that's all it is it seems very simple but it's not simple. There's a lot of complexity in this poem. So I have a list of literary techniques on the side. I want to go through them. So this is a poem that is not spoken by the poet. That is, the speaker is not the poet. We're told that in the little caption that heads the poem, the pool players, seven at the golden shovel. So the speaker are, are this set of seven pool players um, presumably, not totally, not necessarily, but presumably male, given the kind of separation of genders that was occurring in the mid-20th century. It seems like this is a group of young men. How do we know they're young? They're school-aged. We left school. So they're, you know, high school probably aged. So the, the poet is not the speaker. The poet is speaking in the voice of someone else. And the technical term for this, and we'll run into this a couple times in this class, is a dramatic monologue. It's, now, there's a lot of very particular definitions of the dramatic monologue that it requires all sorts of characteristics. I find that a little bit boring. I, I take a very broad definition of the dramatic monologue. I, I think the dramatic monologue is a poem whose speaker is very clearly a fictional character who is not the poet. And that's what we have here. So Gwendolyn Brooks chooses a, a fictional speaker, a speaker not herself. 
She also chooses a collective speaker. So the it, this is not a poem in which you hear an I, it's a poem in which you hear a we. And I think that's important too. And then the next thing I think tells us why these are important. This poem is written in African-American vernacular English. That itself is not a literary technique. That is a dialect of English. That is the particular uh, dialect spoken by many African-Americans in the United States. Okay, And the, um, the, the way you can tell is the first line, we real cool. A linguistic feature of African-American vernacular English is the omission of the verb to be in certain sentences. So we real cool. So that's what tells you it's an African-American vernacular English. The literary technique is the choice to write in African-American vernacular English, which Gwendolyn Brooks did not always do. You can even read other poems in the Penguin Anthology of 20th Century American Poetry by Gwendolyn Brooks that are not written in African-American vernacular English. So, um, and often African-American vernacular English is associated with um, working class speech within the African-American community, whereas the adoption of what's called, I don't mean this in any judgmental way, I think this is just the label for it, what's called standard English is adopted by people trying to access the middle class. So standard English is often associated, that's, it's, it's called standard, but it's its own dialect. It's the dialect of the dominant culture. And if you're coming from the working class, if you're coming from a non-English speaking background, if you're coming from any other background than that dominant culture middle class, you have to adopt that standard English middle class language to, to adopt it, okay? So Brooks was very adept at writing in these two registers. It's often called code switching. But she chooses African American vernacular English, I think, to suggest that her collective speaker, these young men who skipped school to play pool, are not interested in accommodating themselves to that dominant normative culture. All right? So we have a dramatic monologue spoken by young African American men who are not interested in accommodating themselves to white, middle-class, dominant normative culture. That's what's going on in this poem. And one, another way we know that is we left school, we lurk late, we, um, we thin gin, we sing sin. They're not interested in any of the respectability of middle-class culture. They're rejecting that totally. They're leaving school, they stay out late, they drink alcohol, they sing sin, which possibly has like a sexual overtone or a sexual connotation. Um, they're interested in jazz, um, which still, I think at this time, was sort of stigmatized as a form of popular culture that the dominant culture saw as inferior to, let's say, the Western classical music tradition. So this is a collective speaker young African-American men not interested in accommodating, assimilating to the dominant culture. Now, uh, there's a kind of sad or tragic quality to this poem because it suggested that their flight from dominant normative culture is going to end poorly for them. They're going to be destroyed by that. We die soon. By being excluded from this dominant culture by being members of the stigmatized and marked group that resist by not trying to assimilate, nevertheless, that puts them in danger. So we die soon. So that's the narrative of the poem. I think even the specific verbal techniques, though, uh, give it a certain meaning. So this poem uses enjambment and internal rhyme a great deal. If Gwendolyn Brooks were interested in writing this poem in what a, a more expected fashion, you might expect it to be written this way. We real cool, period. Next line, we left school, period. Next line, we lurk late, period. But instead of doing that, she starts what you would expect to be the next line in the line she's writing. We real cool, period, we, and then it, there's enjambment, left school, the sentence picks up on the next line. 
I think that enjambment creates a sense of um, energy. It's the poem is just sort of always ongoing. We real cool. We left school. We lurk late. We strike straight. The line never ends on a full pause. It always ends mid-sentence. And so it, sen it's, it creates a sense of the energy, the vitality of this collective speaker, of these pool players. Also, it creates internal rhyme because by not putting the rhyming words at the end, she puts the rhyming words in the middle of the line. So cool, school, late, straight, sin, gin, june, soon. And this creates a kind of pleasant disorientation, this internal rhyme. That just as you expect the lines to start with we, not to end with we, you expect the lines to end with the rhyme and they don't. So I think that suggests the kind of counter perspective, the counter normativity, the wanting to counter expectations of this collective speaker. Also, the poem has, I haven't taught you this word yet, if you haven't encountered it before, but it uses parallelism. And what parallelism means in poetry is simply the repetition of kind of structures of language. And I, we already talked about it. Every sentence has three words. Every line has four words, which is we, then something, then we. Okay, so the whole poem is parallel in that way. Three word sentences, four word lines um, with we. Sorry, it's not, it's, it's every sentence has, after the first one has three words. Okay, so that parallelism though fails at the end and it fails very powerfully. Every line ends with we and an enjambment and the expectation that the next sentence will begin but the last line, we die soon, period, no we. So that collective speaker has declared its coming death and then has vanished. You expect it to reappear, but it's gone. And with that, Gwendolyn Brooks drives home this tragic, this painful reality of the marginalization unto destruction of this group of people this failed parallelism this failure of the we to reappear this reduction of the poem that had always had three word lines to two words this failed parallel shows the poignant vulnerability to destruction of this group of people and yet they have a kind of heroic um what I called on the last slide a sober, disillusioned realism about it because their way of expressing it is so understated. We die soon. They've sort of, they understand that that's the prospect they face. They understand that and they stoically kind of accept it while going on about their 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 kind of resistance to dominant culture and to normativity and that in a sense that's what cool is right that's why it's called cool you keep your cool in this difficult situation this word cool is only becoming prominent in the middle of the 20th century so their their cool understatement gives them a heroism as they face the challenges ahead that could lead to their destruction so that is the way in which every literary choice Gwendolyn Brooks makes helps her social theme, her social portrait of this seemingly doomed generation exemplified in these seven pool players who have skipped school, who are resisting even unto their deaths a dominant culture that has stigmatized and marginalized them. So I hope that begins to show you how um, literary techniques formal features of works of literature can not only help them to mean whatever it is they mean, but to be kind of powerful social and political statements. Uh, so this, again, is a very short poem, but it contains these multitudes, and it contains them not just, again, a poem is not like an editorial. You can imagine an editorial column in which Gwendolyn Brooks writes about the the tragedy and the heroism of these young men's lives and it would be you know a thousand words long instead she writes this very short poem that's probably not a hundred words long in which she gives voice 
to them and allows them to express that tragic resistance in their language. And that's the power of literary language to reflect and presumably by creating awareness and sympathy affect social reality. Okay, I wanna move on now to Muriel Ruckheiser's The Poem as Mask. I think that this alone of the four poems I wanna talk about uh, in this lecture, this is the one where you most see the rejection of impersonal modernism. Even Gwendolyn Brooks, um, who's writing a, a kind of very, a much more directly political poem than a lot of modernist poets tended to write in We Real Cool, she still doesn't write in her own voice. She adopts another voice. Um, and similarly, in the two poems, Middle Passage and More Light, More Light, you don't hear the poet's voice. The poet doesn't sort of give you an eye, a personal uh, a personal expression in their poems. This is a poem that says, that rejects that. It rejects the idea that the poem should be a mask. So let's just read it real quick. I'm going to read it to you. The poem as mask, Orpheus. When I wrote of the women in their dances and wildness, it was a mask. On their mountain, gold hunting, singing in orgy, it was a mask. When I wrote of the god, fragmented, exiled from himself, his life, the love gone down with song, it was myself, split open, unable to speak, in exile from myself. There is no mountain. There is no god. There is memory of my torn life, myself split open in sleep, the rescued child behind, beside me among the doctors, and a word of rescue from the great eyes. No more masks. No more mythologies. Now, for the first time, the god lifts his hand. The fragments join in me with their own music. So this is a poem by Muriel Ruckheiser. She was born in New York City to a Jewish family and attended private schools and then Vassar and Columbia, so very prestigious colleges. Her first book, like Gwendolyn Brooks, she started very young. Her first book was published in 1935. But she started out as a political radical. She was a radical of the political left, even in the 30s, um, participating in the Spanish Civil War, became an anti-war activist in the Vietnam period, was involved in African-American civil rights struggles throughout her life. And she wrote a lot about feminism and about social justice issues and was a very influential writer in the uh, Jewish American community. She helped to influence the development of reform Judaism, in fact. So that's her biography. But I think this poem is one in which she's redefining what a kind of radical poetry means to her. So what you have to know about this poem is that she's writing about a previous poem she wrote about the, a Greek myth, which is the Greek myth of Orpheus. Orpheus is often considered in Greek mythology a kind of figure for the poet, a kind of representative of the poet, because he was a poet. He was a poet. He sang his poetry with a lyre and was considered a lyre as a kind of stringed instrument. And he sang poetry so beautiful that it famously like tamed the beasts of the forest. And one of the myths about him is that he got married to a woman named Eurydice and she died shortly after their marriage, I think on their wedding night, she died of a snake bite and was taken to the underworld. And Orpheus descended to the underworld and played his music so beautifully that the gods of the underworld agreed to give Eurydice back to him. But there was one condition. The gods of the underworld, Hades, the Greek god of the underworld, said to Orpheus, you go, you return to the upper world I will send Eurydice behind you, and as long as you don't look back, you can, she can be returned to you. But unfortunately, he looked back, and she was taken back to the underworld. And this led him to sort of go mad and become this kind of wandering wild poet, and he died by being torn apart by the uh, Bacantes, these women who were devoted to the god of frenzy, Dionysus, 
they tore him apart. It was called the Sparagmos, the tearing apart of Orpheus by these mad women. And Muriel Ruckheiser had written a poem about this myth. And she said, it was a mask when I wrote of these mythological women. When I wrote of the god, it was a mask. Why was it a mask? Well, let's think about it. Isn't it telling in this myth that the poet is male, Orpheus, and that he's always kind of, in the story of him and Eurydice, his poetry rescues this woman, but she's not a poet. She can't rescue herself. The poet has all the agency. He rescues the woman. Then in the later part of the story, he's destroyed by these mad, irrational, frenzied women. And isn't this a classic misogynistic trope of Western culture, that men are rational and women are irrational? Isn't that a stereotype that is created, uh, well, that is, I don't know if it's created by this myth, but this myth participates in this stereotype of these frenzied women destroying male authority. So Muriel Ruckheiser says, when I wrote about this myth, it was a mask. And not only was it a mask, but it was a mask that has this history of misogynistic sexist ideology. And she says, I don't want to write about this stuff anymore. I don't want to write about these patriarchal myths, these sexist myths. Um, I don't want to have to encode my own experience in these alienating mythologies that are little more than kind of stereotypes from a feminist perspective. What do I want to write about? What is my poetry rooted in? Says Miro Ruckheiser. There is no mountain. There is no God. There is memory of my torn life. Poetry comes from personal experience and it should, says Miro Ruckheiser, come from personal experience. No more masks no more mythologies. And what is the experience in her case? In what way is her life torn? Myself split open in sleep, the rescued child beside me. A very particular experience of childbirth, which for her is this definitively female experience. If poetry that had been male dominated and dominated not only by men, but by male mythologies, well, when that happens, the male experience is privileged. And experiences that are outside of that male experience, like childbirth, are disprivileged, are not spoken of, are not considered chief themes in poetry. And so she wants to say, no, these, my experience, my experience of a woman, my experience of childbirth, is every bit as important as masculine mythology. So that's where my poetry comes from. I reject mythology and I write about my personal experience. And then when that happens, you notice what happens at the end of the poem, the god lifts his hand, the fragments join in me. She kind of be almost becomes the Orpheus figure. She is able to become an authoritative poet by writing about her own experience. The true sparagmos, the true tearing apart, is not the male poet by the female frenzied uh, worshippers of Dionysus, but rather her sparagmos in childbirth, which she elevates to poetry uh, just on an equal playing field with male mythologies. Okay? So, and again, there's a literary technique here, which is allusion. That is where the writer alludes to some other story. In this case, the myth of Orpheus to create her meaning. And I have the phrase here, the personal as political. As we'll see in the 60s, that was one of the slogans of the women's movement, that the pers personal experience was structured by political decisions. That, um, well, for instance, if you... Um, uh, let's go back to my example about what was happening in the economics of the 1950s. If you were African-American 
you couldn't necessarily move into his house in the suburbs because you were excluded there by kind of um, legal forms of racial restriction. So a decision as personal as where you live and in what kind of house is structured by political choices. Same thing for you know a range of marginalized groups. So in that sense, the personal is political. The personal is also political in another sense, which is that if your experience as a member of a marginalized group has been excluded from social discourse, then uttering it, bringing it into literary utterance is a political act, an act of resistance. So when she brings female experience into poetry to rival masculine myths, that is a political intervention. And it was very influential. I have on my slide, so one of the images on my slide is Muriel Ruckheiser. Another image is a painting of Orpheus being torn apart by the worshippers of Dionysus. But my third image is uh, the cover of a book, a very influential anthology of 20th century American women poets called No More Masks. It takes its name from this poem, this idea of female poets dropping these mythologies that hold them back and expressing their personal experience. So Muriel Ruckheiser, I think, is our best example of the poems we're reading at this part of the course of this emergent idea of more personal liberatory styles that are happening in the mid-century period. I do still think, however, that the dominant style, this slide just adds context to what I was saying, so I'm not going to talk about it. I do think the dominant style of the mid-century poetry, of mid-century poetry, tended to be impersonal, tended to not um, kind of include the voice of the poet. And I think a great example of that is Robert Hayden's classic poem, Middle Passage. This is a very long poem. I'm not going to read all of it to you. I just want to pick out a few features of how it's written and what it's about and what that might say about this period of literature. Um, so just briefly, so Robert Hayden was born in 1913 in Detroit. He was an African-American poet. He lived from 1913 to 1980. He was in 1976 the first black poet laureate. He had a very traumatic childhood. He had a lot of vision problems. He had a very violent um, foster family that raised him. He experienced a lot of depression. However, he grew up um, he went to Wayne State uh, University in Detroit. He majored in Spanish. And then, very importantly, in the 1930s, he worked for the Works Progress Administration, which was this government agency during the Roosevelt administration in the Depression that was trying to alleviate the Depression by giving jobs, uh, federal jobs, to various segments of society. And one of the jobs that they gave to particularly to like writers and they would give like jobs and writers and artists they, to writers and artists. They would give grants for putting on plays, for doing histories and things like that. And one of their projects was an oral history of slavery. So in 1930, there were still African-Americans living who had experienced slavery. They were by that time fairly elderly. And so the Works Progress Administration, or Project Administration, I forget, it's the WPA, you can Google it. Um, one of the jobs they gave was to give people kind of grants to collect oral histories from these last living people who'd experienced enslavement. And Robert Hayden um, worked at this job and he collected these testimonies. And I think that's something that probably informs his interest in the subject as expressed in this poem. Um, he, uh, when he got married, he became a Baha'i, a, uh, uh, a member of the Baha'i faith, that's B-A-H-A-I. This is a form of, it's a form of religion kind of adjacent to Islam. It developed in Iran in the 19th century, and it is a very universalist form of religion. It sort of talks about the kind of universal human equality. And this, I think, informed his work. And it informed his work. He had a very different experience from Gwendolyn Brooks because he, because of this faith, because of this interest in universal humanism that I'll explain is expressed in this poem as well, 
he felt very alienated from some of the radical African-American movements of the late 1960s, which tended to emphasize cultural particularism. It tended to say, we need to make art that is very much rooted in black forms of expression, whether that be traditional African-American forms of expression or African um, diasporic forms of expression. We need to express an African-American culture and express it to African-American readers. And Gwendolyn Brooks, I think, uh, as you can already see in her early poem, We Real Cool, written in African-American vernacular English, is very much interested in this. Robert Hayden, I think, was much less taken with this idea. I think he was much more interested in expressing universal values in his work. Not that his, his work is very much about African-American history, but he's not so interested in cultural particularism. And remember, we saw this, this kind of conflict all the way back when we read uh, uh, Alan Locke's Manifesto for the New Negro. We saw this kind of push and pull between the ideas of a kind of pan-Africanism or an African-American nationalism, and I think both of those were very much taken up in the late 60s. And then on the other hand, you saw this idea, and I think that's what's expressed in this poem, of a kind of um, universal humanism rooted in American ideals of equality. So let's look at this poem. It's called Middle Passage. The Middle Passage itself, that was a um, route over the Atlantic Ocean between Africa and the United States that was notorious for its horrors because this, is, it, it, this was happening in the period of slavery and what would happen was people who were um, sort of traders in enslaved people would go to Africa, pick up a number of people they would take into slavery and then transport them in ships across the Middle Passage. But the conditions on these ships were just horrifying. They were unsanitary, they were overcrowded, they were brutal. And so the Middle Passage became synonymous with this, just, just the atrocity that slavery was. So Hayden writes a poem about this subject. It's very much interested in history. However, he does it in, the, in a style that I call montage. Montage is a kind of term from cinema of juxtaposing different images against each other. There is no continuous narrative in this poem. It's a sequence of fragments and different voices coming in and out and allusions, sort of words from elsewhere coming in and out. So he creates a montage of the middle passage. He's not expressing his view. He's not expressing his personal feeling. His voice is rarely heard in the poem. Not only that, but he most of the voices that are heard in the poem are the voices of white slave traders. So he uses this kind of dramatic monologue technique where he gives you excerpts from the diaries or from testimony of white slave traders. And that's one of his ways of getting across the horror of the Middle Passage is not only describing it, but giving it to you in the voice of those who created the horrors, which makes it all the more horrific. And that's sometimes the way dramatic monologues work is they, um, poets will write in the voice of unsympathetic characters who inadvertently reveal how unsympathetic they are, okay? And I think that's what happens in this poem. So let's just, uh, let's just look at how it works. Let's read the first couple stanzas. So it begins, Jesus, Estrella, Esperanza, Mercy, colon, that's the mark of punctuation, colon, Sails flashing to the wind like weapons, sharks following the moans, the fever and the dying, horror the corpusant, and the compass rose. So, one thing you need to know this too is a very elusive poem. Jesus, Estre Estrella, Esperanza, and Mercy are historical names of slave ships. And there's a grim irony here, which is Estrella means star, Esperanza means hope. Mercy is mercy. Jesus is Jesus. These are all very beautiful, hopeful, compassionate-seeming names 
for ships that are engaged in this atrocious activity. Sails flashing to the wind like weapons. Well, they were weapons to the people who were the victims. So there's a lot of irony in this poem, a lot of juxtaposition of, you know, Jesus, the, the you know, Jesus with his message of universal brotherhood and equality being given as the name of a slave ship. That's a grim irony in the first word of the poem. All right, next stanza. Middle passage, voyage through death to life upon these shores. And I think life upon these shores is a phrase that will take on a great meaning by the poem's end. So I want to I hold off on thinking about that. I'm not going to read the whole poem again. The next stanza is, it's. I think it's in quotation marks, and it sounds like a kind of excerpt from a diary or a ship's log. 10 April, 1800, Black's rebellious, crew uneasy. Our linguist says their moaning is a prayer for death, ours and their own, etc. So this is the first time we hear the voice of the white slave traders, and it's very... It doesn't it's in it doesn't understand this voice this this white man doesn't understand the sufferings of the Africans that he is enslaved and is carrying he has to have a linguist translate you know and it, there's an irony there a linguist says they're moaning you know as if moaning were not sort of universal as if you as if that that were not a universal language this voice is so callous that it doesn't understand the pain that it's dealing with, okay? So you get the first kind of voice of the white slave trader that um, that undercuts itself, that reveals its own moral callousness. Then I wanna look at several lines here though. Deep in the festering hold thy father lies, uh, of his bones New England pews are made, those are altar lights that were his eyes. That's an allusion to a song in one of Shakespeare's plays. In Shakespeare's play, The Tempest, uh, there's a song that goes, I have it on the side, full fathom five thy father lies, of his bones are coral made, those are pearls that were his eyes, okay? Nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. So what's the allusion to Shakespeare doing here in this poem? Similarly, um, it's uh, on the next page, it's also an allusion to a modernist poem called The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, who also alluded to Shakespeare. So we have Robert Hayden writing this poem, and he's alluding to Shakespeare and to T.S. Eliot, a white modernist poet. And similarly, in the next uh, sort of excerpt I give, there's an excerpt from, a again, another white captain of one of these ships, who talks about how the awful experience they're having, and he says, which one of us has killed an albatross? That's a reference to a 19th century British poem called The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, which is about a doomed sea voyage that is doomed when the uh, speaker of the poem kills an albatross and brings bad luck to the ship. So my point is, this poem, which is about the experience of slavery, makes all these allusions to classic works of European literature by white authors. Why is Hayden doing that? What does it mean? I'm almost at the end of my time, and this is a very complicated poem. So I think I'm going to do what I did when we looked at Susie Asado by Gertrude Stein. I'm going to try to create a little uh, suspense here in this course. I'm going to pick up with this in the next lecture. I'm going to begin the next lecture by concluding my discussion of Hayden's Middle Passage. But I want you to think about it. Read this poem, read it again. What, what is Shakespeare doing? What is Coleridge doing? What are they doing in these poems? There's also lines from traditional Protestant hymns in this. Um, so when he says, Jesus, Savior, pilot me over life's tempestuous sea, Jesus, Savior, these are lines from traditional Protestant hymns. So what are these allusions to classic European literature by white authors doing here? We saw Langston Hughes try to write Europe out of history in The Negro Speaks of Rivers. 
Why is Hayden bringing these voices in? Is he bringing them in maybe to charge them with complicity in the slavery that was contemporaneous with their um, creation? Or is he bringing them in as support? What is he doing? I'm going to let you think about that question, and I am going to begin my next lecture with a discussion of Middle Passage, then a discussion of Anthony Hecht's poem, More Light, More Light, and then we'll begin talking about our next novel, The Martyred by Richard E. Kim. So you'll want to get started reading that. For now, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for your attention, and I hope you have a great day.